Welcome back, everyone. We're sitting here at CPAC with Cleo Pascal. She's a senior fellow at the Defense for Democracies. We're going to talk about China, India, and what's happening going forward with them. Hey, Cleo, real pleasure to have you on Crossroads. Great to be here. Thank you. So, under the Trump administration, we saw the formation of this Quad Alliance, India, Japan, Australia, the United States. And a lot of questions are now kind of swirling around what is the future of these kinds of alliances, and will other countries kind of maintain their strong stance against the CCP with or without the United States. You know, what are we seeing with this? That is the key question. That's what everybody in the neighborhood is wondering. And what's happened with the Quad, with the establishment of the Quad, is at the same time those four countries came together, a lot of bilaterals built up. So India, Japan built up, India, Australia built up. And what the Trump administration did was make sure that those individual countries had what they needed to go forward with the policy, even if the U.S. wasn't there. Sold a lot of weapons to Taiwan, gave a lot of intel to India. So the, the pieces are in place for it to play a really important role going forward. Uh, what are we seeing with India in particular? You know, India is kind of a blind spot for most Americans. What, what are they doing with yeah. China right now? So in June 2020, China attacked India and killed 20 of its soldiers. And that was a complete game changer for India. Anybody who was pro-China in India after that had to keep very, very quiet. And there was a big, well-moneyed China lobby. But they got pushed to the side, and India's gone full steam ahead. One of the first things they did, very interestingly, was ban a bunch of Chinese apps, including WeChat and TikTok, because the Chinese were using the metadata to weaponize their AI. So India has been pushing back in many, many different ways ever since June 2020. It's, it's a game changer. Now, Australia as well, I saw that after Biden, you know, he, he got called out for basically kind of suggesting, it's not clear what, what the exact context was, but he was suggesting, it seemed, that genocide of Muslim Uyghurs is just part of the Chinese, like, cultural norm, as he explained it. Actually, in the Australian government, after that, asked Biden for clarification. And I was really surprised to see that. I was like, wow, Australia is holding the American government accountable on this? What are you seeing with Australia positioning So Australia's been really interesting. Australia was the first to ask for a COVID-19 investigation. And they got punished for it hard by Beijing. They put in places a lot of tariffs on everything from coal to beef to lobster to wine, all the things that we should now be buying from Australia to make up for what China is doing to their economy. They're trying to really punish them, but they haven't backed down. So it's been a very interesting uh, new Australia that we're seeing that's giving backbone to several other countries in the region as well. You know, in Japan, just about this whole alliance is an interesting position as well. If we go back to, you know, the whole start of the South China Sea, East China Sea issue, when China basically claimed ownership over the Diaoyu Islands or the Senkaku Islands, which side you're on with that? Um, technically, Senkaku Islands. Uh, you know, Japan basically seeing the aggression of the Chinese Communist Party change its entire defense posture. They went from being a country that doesn't really have much of a military or a real push for military ambitions to having to rebuild their military and the, and the standards that allow them to engage in war if needed to face the Chinese Communist Party. And from what I get for a long time, they, there was a lot of fear in Japan over whether they could stand up to China, but this new alliance has really kind of solidified their own defensive posture. Uh, where are you seeing Japan heading with this? Japan has taken two interesting paths. One is to say the problem that we're going to have is economic. The Chinese entry point is economic. So we want to start to give countries in the region economic alternatives, especially around things like energy. So they've been repositioning themselves around LNG, being an LNG provider, which justifies having your ships go up and down, which justifies a free and open Indo-Pacific seaway. So that's one thing they did. The other is they've been looking very closely at the small island states like Palau, these little countries that were very pivotal during World War II. There were military bases there that the Japanese had. They know this from their own experience that where China's trying to get in. So they've been trying to establish better relationships with the small Pacific Island countries to try to keep China out and less able to establish military presence. Now, let's talk about Burma or Myanmar, depending on yeah. what you want to call it at this point. Um, we, of course, had the military takeover and, you know, look, it was a military coup, essentially. And a lot of my viewers have been asking, was China involved? And from what we're seeing now, there is some evidence that the Chinese Communist Party was involved with the military there. What's really happening in Myanmar? Yeah, so there's a lot of Chinese backing for 
for the military coup. Uh, and there's a secondary aspect to that, which is that normally when an authoritarian power comes in, like a coup comes in, the West starts to pull back and starts to punish it, which gives China an even bigger opening. So yes, they were backing the coup. Could, could it have been pulled back towards a more West-friendly or less China-friendly situation? It's difficult politically because now they're a coup. And this is where we get circle back to India. India has been, doesn't have that problem. So they can continue their relationship with Myanmar and try to be a third pathway that's not China or the West to get Myanmar out of the problem that it's in now vis-a-vis -vis Chinese essentially taking them over so that they can get a pathway down into the Bay of Bengal. I guess just last question, where, where, does, where is this all heading? I, I can briefly say kind of my general analysis. Yeah. I, now I would kind of think that India might play a much bigger role in that whole region. They don't have the whole Trump or, you know, conservative Democrat type, you know, dichotomy. They, they don't, they're not involved in that whole political narrative when it comes to standing up against the CCP. And we really see also Germany taking a stronger stance against the CCP as well in Europe. But it's mixed, right? Now, part of me would think that maybe we'll see one country come up as kind of a more of a world leader stance. But it, Based on what I'm seeing now, it seems like more like an international alliance has formed against the CCP. And the question now is whether the U.S. will stay in that or not. I'm, I'm curious in your analysis, where is this heading and to what extent will the U.S., for example, siding more with the CCP impact that? So the CCP, its, it's goal is to be number one in the world with comprehensive national power. That means to dominate every single aspect in a country, economic, military, social, all of it. Some countries are better at fighting back economically. Some are better at fighting back in terms of defense. Some are better at fighting back in terms of science. So as you said, what we're going to need to push back against this comprehensive national power push is a comprehensive multinational defense, where countries bring to the table what they have, which is unique, to push back against the CCP. Hey, Cleo, real pleasure having you on Crossroads. And where can people find more about your work? You can go to the Foundation for Defense of Democracy's website. You can ask my dad. He usually wants to talk about what I'm up to. Uh, I'm on Twitter, but that's about it. Cleo Pass, C-L-E-O-P-A-S-K-A-L. That's it. Okay, real pleasure having you on Crossroads. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.